Good morning. I'm happy to be joined here today by California Attorney General Javier Becerra. And along with me is my Chief Assistant, uh, Jesse Smith, Chief Deputy Ron Flynn, and Deputy City Attorneys Christine Van Aken, Yvonne Murray, Molly Lee, and Aileen McGrath, who have been working tirelessly uh, on the action that we filed Friday afternoon. Unfortunately, here we are again. Despite already receiving a strong rebu rebuke from the courts in a separate case, President Donald Trump's administration has kept up its attacks on sanctuary cities, counties, and states. We are here today to announce that we have filed a second federal lawsuit against President Trump's administration, this time over the Department of Justice's instituting unconstitutional new conditions on federal law enforcement grants known as Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grants. San Francisco's lawsuit is part of a coordinated effort with California Attorney General Javier Becerra, who will file a similar lawsuit today on behalf of the state of California. Our lawsuit names U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions and his Justice Department. It seeks a court order declaring Sessions' new grant conditions unconstitutional and void. The federal government is threatening to withhold millions of dollars in law enforcement grants unless local governments acquiesce to two unauthorized and unlawful conditions. First, to allow federal immigration agents unlimited access to local detention facilities to interrogate detainees about their immigration status. And two, when requested to provide 48 hours notice to immigration agents before releasing someone that the federal government suspects is in the country unlawfully. There are several problems with both conditions. One is that too often, immigration agents are wrong. Since 2007, about 700 American citizens have been erroneously held in local jails on federal immigration detainers, according to uh, NPR reporting. Another 800 Americans were held in immigration detention centers, centers during that same time frame. The new grant conditions mean residents and U.S. citizens could be jailed without probable cause and cities or states could face legal liability for holding someone past their release date to provide the federal government the required 48 hours notice. This is a backdoor attempt to coerce states and local governments to carry out federal immigration enforcement. Immigration enforcement is the federal government's job. They can do it in San Francisco and every other city in the country. We are not stopping them. We are not going to devote our limited law enforcement resources to that task. Our police and deputies are focused on fighting crime, not breaking up hardworking families. We've had to take this step and go to court to pr protect San Franciscans, Californians, and people across the country. The president is once again attempting to end run the Constitution. The Department of Justice does not have authority from Congress to impose these conditions for good reason. In the name of public safety, this president is undercutting law enforcement and trying to withhold money used to reduce crime. Maybe that makes sense to this White House, but it doesn't add up for most Americans. We have a president who is bent on trying to vilify immigrants and punish cities that prioritize real, effective public safety over splitting up hardworking families by falsely claiming that sanctuary cities are havens for criminals. Nothing could be further from the truth. Sanctuary policies improve public safety by ensuring anyone can seek help, seek help if they are a victim of a crime or a witness to a crime. Anyone can call 911 without fear that it will lead them or someone they know to being deported. This cooperation with law enforcement gets criminals off the streets and makes everyone safer. And that is precisely why more than 600 cities, counties, and states across the country have some type of sanctuary policy. Trump attacked sanctuary cities in January with his unlawful executive order. We stopped him in court. Then he tried to sneak through a change in the law by burying it deep in his budget. Now he's trying to have one of his departments rewrite the rules. So we're back in court once again with allies by our side to compel his administration to follow the law. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, California's Attorney General Javier Becerra to say a few words about the um, case that California will be uh, filing today alongside ours. And I can't imagine a better partner uh, to pursue this litigation with. And he's been uh, a tremendous partner as we've come up with a coordinated approach to how we're going to uh, fight the administration's uh, latest orders. Mr. Attorney General. Thank you. Mind if I move this? Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me begin by thanking 
Dennis Herrera, the attorney for this great city of San Francisco, and all the people, quite honestly, of San Francisco, along with Mayor Lee, everyone who stood up to say that we want to do things the right way. Uh, it is so important. But I want to thank uh, City Attorney Herrera and also his team for the work that they have done already to give us a platform from which to work with. And I want to thank uh, the folks in the Department of Justice, in the Office of the Attorney General for the State of California as well, for the work that they have done on behalf of the 40 million people of the State of California. I'm pleased to have Angela Sierra, who has led our team in these efforts over these last several months to try to make sure that not only do we all follow the Constitution, but that we respect the work that's being done by law enforcement day in, day out, both here in California and throughout the United States of America. I'd also like to, before I get into the meat of my remarks, just uh, uh, send a quick word of thanks and appreciation to the men and women in law enforcement, the first responders who stood up and did their job in Charlottesville, Virginia, yesterday. What we witnessed, the acts of terrorism, must be condemned. We cannot let people believe that it's right to do wrong. And in this particular case, I think it became obvious because the eyes of America were on the activities of those white supremacists. And so we must act. And so I, I say to all those who are victim, the victims of the injustice that occurred yesterday, our hearts and our thoughts are with you. And at the end, justice should prevail, just as it should in this particular case. And so let me turn to this case in particular. I think it's important first to note that California, the city of San Francisco, we abide by federal law. We respect the Constitution. The federal government should do the same. The Trump administration has instituted policies that are not only reckless, but illegal. And it's our right and it's our duty to fight to protect our law enforcement officers, the men and women who have the badge, who protect us day in and day out, and to protect the resources that they rely upon to get their work done of public safety. It's a low blow to our men and women who wear the badge for the federal government to threaten their crime-fighting resources in order to force them to do the work of the federal government when it comes to immigration enforcement. Whether it's San Francisco, Dennis Herrera, and the police officers, the sheriff's deputies in San Francisco, or law enforcement throughout the state of California, we're in the public safety business. And I say that as a chief law enforcement officer for the 40 million people in the state of California. We're in the public safety business. We're not in the deportation business. We're in the best position here in California, in San Francisco, in any of our local cities, our counties, throughout the state, we're in the best position to determine how best to enforce the law and keep our people safe. And we're in the best position to determine how to use the resources we get from the taxes we pay to the federal treasury and get back to California to the money that we provide locally for the work that must be done. We're in the best position to determine how best to utilize those public safety resources. And we use those resources to implement our public safety laws without, I repeat, without undermining legitimate federal immigration laws and policies. The Trump administration should recognize that any attempt to force state and local governments to redirect their law enforcement resources to engage in federal immigration practices against their better judgment does not enhance, but rather diminishes public safety. The Trump administration is starting with a very misguided premise. It thinks that immigrant communities are a danger to our public safety. That could be no further from the truth. Most of us who are in law enforcement know that. Most of us know that most of those who have come to this country are here to build it, not wreak havoc. And we are here to say to every one of the people who lives, whether in our city or in our state, if you're here to build this city, 
and our state, if you're here to work hard, then we want you to know that you'll be safe. And we want the federal government to know that we'll do everything to stop them from jeopardizing our ability as those responsible for public safety from getting that done. The police, not Washington, D.C., the Sheriff's Department, here in the state, here in our cities, here in our counties, it is the police and the Sheriff's Departments that are located here. It is not the federal government in Washington, D.C. that is best able to serve the needs of the people of San Francisco or the state of California. The Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program is critical to all of us, whether it's San Francisco or the state of California. We all rely on those grants for crime fighting. I, as a member of Congress for 24 years, used to help fight to get those funds for my state and for our cities. It is hard to believe that now that the federal government would try to jeopardize those crime fighting funds simply because it wishes to pressure local governments to do their bidding on federal immigration law. That's unacceptable, and it's an unacceptable choice. That's why I am not only pleased, but I'm proud to join with City Attorney Herrera today in filing a lawsuit against the Trump administration for trying to unconstitutionally and unlawfully compel us to do with our federal public safety resources what we think is best to meet the needs of our people on the ground, whether in San Francisco or any part of the state of California. We will fight to keep our streets safe, and we will fight to get back the tax dollars we contribute to the federal treasury to do the work of local law enforcement here in California that we not only deserve, but we paid for as taxpayers to the federal treasury and deserve to give back. It's enough that California is a donor state to the federal treasury. We always give more in federal taxpayer dollars than we get back. Now we're being told we won't get some of those dollars back that we not only deserve but are entitled to simply because we won't follow Donald Trump's edicts on immigration. That's not the way we do things here in California or in San Francisco. And so when those threats come at us, we will take them on. We will take them on as the people of the city of San Francisco. We will take them on as the 40 million people for the state of California. And so, as I said, Today, we will file a lawsuit to join with the city of San Francisco to try to make it clear. We're intent on fighting crime. We're intent on gaining the resources that we need. And we're intent on stopping anyone who would try to deny us the dollars that we have earned, the dollars that we have paid for to provide the resources to the men and women who wear the badge, who are today protecting us from anyone who wants to try to commit a crime against them. It's our duty to do that, and that's why we stand here today. We'll take any questions at this time. Dennis Lynch. Interesting, and it sets up an obvious state city rights versus federal rights. Your brother issues that always brought this up, sometimes been a conservative issue, but in this situation, really just set up a state of California, city of San Francisco versus the federal government. We've seen that with a couple other, obviously, filings earlier this year, San Francisco other states as well. With this one here, I mean, you can see this is a chance of maybe getting precedent in some respect. I'll let the Attorney General speak to uh, uh, how important he believes uh, uh, California as a whole is in this, but I can just tell you from um, uh, our perspective, uh, the fact that we are standing here together and that we are going to be in this coordinated action together, I think uh, speaks volumes about the importance that we as Californians, not just as San Franciscans, place on this issue and protecting uh, our residents, uh, and at the same time that we make sure that we are protecting um, undocumented immigrants, native-born, and taxpayer dollars that Californians pay to the federal treasury. And this, you're right, this is a discussion about what is the appropriate role of local and state government versus federal power, and our, our lawsuit, uh, both in the sanctuary city, broader lawsuit in this one, uh, 
have highlighted that issue about the executive branch overstepping its bounds with respect to the legislative branch, but also with respect to what localities and states who are best situated to know how to protect their communities, uh, what's best for them. So I, I would agree with that, and it's something that, uh, uh, something we think needs to be highlighted. Uh, I agree with what uh, City Attorney Ferrer just said, and I would only add this. Um, I don't see this as a fight against the federal government. Uh, we're fighting to protect the Constitution. We're trying to abide by the, the words of the Constitution that left all those powers that are, are not enumerated in the Constitution for the federal government to the states and the local governments. We're not trying to fight against Donald Trump and his administration. We're trying to preserve the words of the Constitution. And I will tell you, 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 we see every day how important it is for our police and our sheriff to have the resources they need. We saw it on display yesterday. I suspect somewhere in America we'll see it on display today where someone will risk his or her life to protect someone else. No one should be telling that officer, that deputy sheriff, how to do his or her job from Washington, D.C. If they're, if they're obligated to protect the people here locally. And that's what we're fighting for is to make sure that those funds that we've paid for through our taxes come back so that those men and women who wear the badge can do the job the right way, whether in Charlottesville or in San Francisco. Yeah, I'll speak locally. Um, we get about $1.5 million here in San Francisco. We get 500000 or so um, uh, directly from the federal government, and we have for decades, and we get another 900000 to a $1 million uh, indirectly through the state. Uh, and that goes to fund every, everything from uh, diversion programs to uh, adult alternative courts to uh, social work intervention, uh, trying to ensure that at-risk youth are getting services that they need. But more broadly, uh, this impacts California and the federal government. I'll let the Attorney General speak to what's at stake for California. Over $28 million for jurisdictions throughout the city, uh, the state of California. Uh, for everything, as the city attorney just said, from recidivism, uh, reduction to uh, drug, drug work to keep people off drugs, to keeping our young people from becoming members of gangs, all the work that you do to fight crime, but also to prevent crime. Well, first of all, I, I think that um, I want to uh, take you back to something that the Attorney General highlighted. Uh, we're fighting to protect the Constitution and the rule of law. And the fact that it is playing out uh, in a local and state uh, initiated lawsuit doesn't mean that we are trying to trump federal rights. It means we're tr sticking up for the Constitution and the separation of powers to make sure that people's constitutional rights are protected. You are correct that historically that has been used uh, a, 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 by conservatives, uh, but it's also been used uh, by uh, more liberal jurisdictions, as you've seen uh, a devolution of, of power and people want people to get down to state and local management of their own issues. But make no mistake, this is about protecting uh, the constitutional rights and the separation of powers that exist for everybody. And uh, uh, if the federal government is going to cho choose to ignore uh, those principles, I think local and state governments have an obligation to step up to make sure that they are reinforced and that the rule of law uh, continues to reign. And, and I would only ask that uh, you take a look at history and the utilization of the state rights argument in the past. It was used to allow states and local governments to violate the constitutional rights of individuals. We're not asking our police officers and sheriff's deputies to violate the rights of the people they're sworn to protect. So there's a very different use of the 10th Amendment and the state's rights argument today being uh, utilized. We're not out there to try to 
shield ourselves from the Constitution's, protect, uh, Constitution's protections to people who have rights under the Constitution, as they did in the South when they were out there using the Tenth Amendment to violate the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment. If, unless you can show me that we're, there's somewhere in here that San Francisco or California is violating individuals' First, Fourth, uh, Fifth, Fourteenth Amendment rights, uh, we're trying to protect people, not to harm them. On the two things you're asking for, obviously, more controversial would be to allow officers to go into jail from federal, federal agencies. Maybe a little less controversial, still controversial, obviously, here is the ability to, to notify, um, I think it's 48 hours. What, what is the, uh, can you just clarify the notification opposition a little bit more than the other one, if you don't mind? Uh, well, the interesting thing is uh, the, the, um, the uh, um, provision is a little bit ambiguous. Right? What is 48 hours? You, uh, you have to remember that oftentimes that's something that's not necessarily in control of, uh, of the sheriff or something. It's, it's pursuant to a court order. So to give 48 hours notice might mean that someone has already been allowed to be released and now they want notification. And to the degree that you are um, detaining that individual without probable cause, now you're violating the Fourth Amendment and exposing the municipality or jurisdiction that is holding that individual to financial liability. So uh, uh, the conditions themselves are ambiguous and not really uh, very well thought out. Can you go over those conditions again? Yeah, there were two. Um, one where the uh, federal government wants uh, jurisdictions to give authority for their agents uh, to come in to respective jails and jurisdictions to interrogate and question and talk to individuals. And number two, to give 48 hours notice of uh, uh, impending release of um, someone they are interested in uh, um, learning more about. Well, um, I'll let the Attorney General speak to the, the California's motivation, which I think is similar to ours. Um, when the July 25th directive came out, we were studying those in light of our broader sanctuary uh, lawsuit to examine whether this was uh, a backdoor attempt to continue to uh, enforce uh, uh, the principles that the Department of Justice and the Trump administration had said they were going to stand up for through the back door. And uh, it's pretty clear that uh, this is another attempt to accomplish what they're unsuccessful in accomplishing with the Sanctuary City Executive Order. Uh, many of the issues are the same, the 48-hour detainer notice. They've, they have a thing about wanting us to comply with detainer requests and, and 48 hours notice. This has been something that is that is um, uh, been a, a core principle. So now, using the grants and the threat of withholding that money, it's to accomplish the same goal. So we have been on this from the, uh, from the beginning, but I know that the Attorney General has probably broader concerns because of the dollars that are at stake for California more broadly. Uh, Dennis is right. Uh, $28 million is a dollar 28 million times. That's a lot of money. Uh, and to San Francisco and to some of the smaller jurisdictions who can't make that money up, it's big. It's the difference between trying to keep someone from going in the wrong direction and having them become the next serial murderer. Uh, you'd never know. So it's important. But what's perhaps more important overall is the indirect pressure it places all these cities and counties under in having to worry about whether they can actually apply for funds. It's the heavy hand of the federal government imposing its will and threatening you, you know, take me on. Now for, for San Francisco, especially with a, a city like San Francisco that has a dynamic legal team uh, headed by the city attorney uh, that is willing to take on whatever comes at them, maybe it's a little easier. But some of the smaller cities and counties of California would probably find it very difficult to take on something like this 
and feel comfortable. Because if at the end they lose, they've not only spent money to try to battle this, but they won't get the funds from the grant program as well. So it's, a, it's an ominous threat, which goes back to the question about the difference between what we're doing with the 10th Amendment and state rights and what was done before. Now the federal government is using the threat of its power, of its size, to bully local jurisdictions to do what they want. And fortunately, you've got the city of San Francisco. I think there'll be other jurisdictions like you saw in Chicago and now the state of California are going to say no. States, as far as I know, yes. But there are, we heard, we know Chicago has acted. Um, I believe along with San Francisco, you'll probably see uh, some other local jurisdictions in the state as well probably take action. Yeah, uh, the uh, sanctuary um, uh, city lawsuit that we filed was re in response to uh, the president's executive order dealing with sanctuary uh, cities. And uh, we filed a motion for preliminary injunction in that case, filed suit saying that the order was unconstitutional. We did that uh, and we worked alongside uh, the county of Santa Clara and we uh, uh, received a uh, ruling from the United States District Court for the Northern District of California with a nationwide injunction preventing that executive order from going into effect. After that, the uh, government moved for uh, a motion to dismiss and a, dismiss and a motion for reconsideration uh, based on a new sort of limiting instruction that the Department of Justice had issued, but that those were denied by uh, uh, the United States District Court, Judge Oreck and the federal government has appealed those rulings and uh, that injunction uh, and stay remain in effect. So the executive order has not been implemented. So we joined in as well with the initial action taken by San Francisco along with Santa Clara and uh, was City of Richmond as well. Um, <coughs> and we're joining in to join, and we're joining in, we're joining in with the City of San Francisco. I don't believe it'll stop there because uh, I, the closer some of these jurisdictions look at what the Trump administration is trying to do, the more they recognize that the Trump administration probably won't stop here. And so they know that they're going to be under this constant threat of bullying if they don't stand up at some point. And that's where I believe it's very important for the state of California to come in because some of these, as I said, smaller cities and counties, it would be a tough, tough thing for them to try to take on the federal government by themselves. No, I just, I'm just defending the rights of the people of the state of California. I'm going in because uh, what the Trump administra administration is trying to do is unconstitutional. It's unlawful. And why should I permit that to occur? And we got $28 million at stake and more in the future. So we're going in because we abide, as I said before, we abide by federal law. We abide by the Constitution. So should the federal government. Okay, uh, now the government uh, will have to respond uh, to the complaint, uh, and that'll be in probably 30 days or so, maybe a little bit more, and then we'll just be in litigation. There may be some other procedural steps that occur in the interim, uh, but in terms of substance, we'll await the government's response, and that won't be for a month or two. Well, the, uh, the federal government runs under its uh, authorization uh, timeline, uh, which, by the way, over the last several years it hasn't abided by. Uh, and so when the next round of burn grants will be uh, issued is unclear. Uh, but certainly the, if we were not to take this action, uh, certain grants could be put in, placed in jeopardy, and certain existing grants 
might, I'm not sure if they would try to revoke them, but what we're trying to do is make, establish the grounds under which uh, states and local governments can apply for these grants so that they don't have to worry about the intimidation that occurs and they can move forward. A lot of these jurisdictions are preparing to apply for grants and they're preparing to do so by the 25th of August, I believe, is the deadline. And so they're, I've, I know I've been contacted by uh, more than uh, just a few jurisdictions asking, so what can we do? There's a, and I'll let the uh, city attorney explain that, but uh, we're representing the entire state. Uh, each city, each county has its own ordinances and, and ways of doing business. We at the state level don't try to tell the city of San Francisco how to do its public safety. For the same reason, we don't want the feds to tell the state or our local jurisdictions how to do our public safety. But there are, ba there are different grounds under which each of us can uh, take on the federal government, but uh, let me let the city, city attorney answer more completely there for him. I, I think that I couldn't have said it any better than the attorney general, other than you, you, you'll notice once they um, they file uh, uh, their complaint, while we're both going for the same goal, we have different grounds that we're, that we're uh, going after the federal government are, so you may see slight deviations in the nature of our complaint, and that's just the nature of litigation when you have uh, a couple of different parties. So, but we will be litigating this uh, side by side. Here we go again. Um, well, um, I said earlier, uh, you work hard in this state. You try to build up your neighborhood. You do what my mom and dad did. I'm the son of immigrants. Um, we want to protect you. We want you to feel like you should continue to create jobs and build up this state and grow our economy. We want you to feel safe. Um, if I were a dreamer, a young man or woman who came to this country as a child, I'd certainly be concerned. But if you give any credence to the words of Donald Trump, where he said they should, these dreamers should rest easy when it comes to the DACA program, then I have to believe that that means that the president is prepared to do what's right with regard to the DACA program. Uh, the five-year anniversary of the program is this week. Um, and once again, if it's appropriate legally to do what we can to preserve the rights of individuals, in this case under the DACA program, I can guarantee you that City Attorney Herrera, I, and anyone else who has the legal power and means to do so, will do whatever we can. Thank you very much. I did. No. Yeah, 500 directly, 900,000 indirectly through the state. That's correct. That's correct. Thanks very much.